Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I'm Alex Greenwood. Well, we have another great author interview ahead on this episode, and I couldn't be more excited because this book, which is just being released here in July, it's it's being released uh, Amazon UK for sure, and we'll ask him more, but we're going to talk to Aldo Tranuto about his new book, The Curse of Knowing, and I want to tell you something, folks. I haven't gotten my hands on it just yet because it's brand new, but I've read up on it, and I've seen some excerpts, and I want to tell you something. I am just really excited to get my hands on this book, and I think you're going to enjoy meeting Aldo. So without further ado, Aldo Tranuto, welcome to Mysterious Goings On. Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. My it's a great pleasure. pleasure being here. Oh, well, it's, it's my pleasure. Now, where are you talking to us from at this very moment? It's a beautiful place where I'm now. It's uh, uh, close to Portofino on the uh, coast of uh, Liguria, which is northern Italy, um, by the sea, basically. Uh, and so it, it's a beautiful day, summer day. Uh, I can see the the sea from my oh my goodness window and and so i'm sorry about that <laughs> Many people probably would, would say oh why is this guy uh <laughs> bragging about the place where but you know this is a place th this is the perfect place where to write a book actually oh. I, I can I can relate. Uh, one of the best times I ever had was staying with friends in Laguna Beach, California, and they had a seaside home. And just looking out and seeing the ocean while I was writing was very inspirational to me. And please don't feel bad at all. You're not, as we say in America, rubbing it in or anything. I just love to hear about it. And by your accent, I'm, I thought you probably were not from Iowa. Well, exactly. This must be specified. Well, unfortunately, you cannot put uh, the, the subtitles because it's a podcast. Uh, but I hope, <laughs> I hope people will understand me just the same. Yeah, I'm from Italy. And, uh, and uh, I actually divide my life between uh, uh, the place where I'm now, uh, mm -hmm. which is Camogli. Uh, it's a beautiful village, beautiful. And, uh, and uh, central London, where I... Uh, spend at least three, four months a year, at least sometimes, sometimes more, which is also a very inspiring place uh, for, for writing and, uh, and, and not just that. I mean, um, I think London is a perfect place where you can uh, work, but also even better if you, uh, if you don't have to take the tube every morning. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I, I love, there as well a lot yeah i spent quite a bit of time in london um i used to be attached to someone from there and spent a great deal of time there and i was enchanted by it i i enjoyed being there very much i miss it i miss it terribly i wonder and uh, we'll, we'll ask the obligatory question if you don't mind how is it going in italy with the with covid19 how how is your particular area faring well um this particular place where I'm um, now has been basically, and it remained un, un, unscathed, untouched by the coronavirus. I mean, this village, there have been three cases and no people died. Um, but you know, uh, Italy, uh, everybody knows about Italy. Uh, it, it, it has been the first Western country to be hit by coronavirus. Uh, and so, I mean, everybody, was looking at Italy at the beginning uh, in a very concerned way. Then, uh, then now, nobody talks about Italy uh, any longer because uh, you know there are other countries that unfortunately are. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Sadly, and, yes. <laughs> and so now, now we we are going. I mean, I I, I I didn't want to use the word normal because I find it so boring actually because everybody talks about new normal normal old normal <laughs> the future no I, I mean i don't know uh, it, it's not you you perceive that something uh, there is a, a deep mutation a deep change in, in, within the society 
uh, and so I mean, even though now in this precise moment, uh, uh, um, people people have started to uh, to not not wear all the time a mask. I mean, they right. don't need to, to to wear it all the time. It's not compulsory mm. um, anymore. At least uh, as long as you are in an open space. If you if you go into a shop, you have to, of course. But uh, I mean you perceive the difference in the attitude of the people. And, uh, and so, I mean, things are getting much better now. Uh, and, but despite this, let me see, it's, the virus is, even though it's, it's not in the air, it's still in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, you know, but we must get used to it. Yeah. By the way, I was in London when, uh, when the whole thing started. Uh, and I left London, I remember, because uh, we were concerned about what was happening here in Italy. And uh, the day we left, my, my wife and myself, we left from London was uh, March the 9th. And, uh, and it, was, it was very weird because a lot of people were already dying in Italy, but London was totally normal. I mean, people taking the tube, the, the, the cars grab, uh, uh, crammed with, packed with people, uh, people shaking hands, uh, hugging, normal. And we say, wow, but why, I mean, why nobody here cares about what's happening? So, so no, they care, but mm. they don't take any. So we were a little bit puzzled by this, by this. And unfortunately, uh, then we realized that uh, um, the UK went uh, uh, through a similar path as, as us, right. uh, in some ways even worse, which is very sad because, I mean, we have been the first, uh, Italy has been the first country, uh, uh, but you know, it, 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 and so everybody could, uh, could take uh, uh, um, that, our case as an example to do different things and to do better than us. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, that was not the case. It certainly wasn't the case in the United States. We did not learn well. We did not learn our lesson from uh, the, the horrific tragedy that, that befell your country. But I, I, although I appreciate you sharing that, and I, I, I know the last thing you want to talk about probably was COVID, but I just couldn't resist asking you. Um, you're the first person from Italy I've spoken with in, in all year. So it's really interesting to hear your perspective. And I'm very glad to hear that your particular village is, is virtually unscathed and, and uh, things are well. Um, uh, so let's let's turn the page, shall we? Um, and let's talk about the curse of knowing. I I want to. How? What kind of book is this? Is this? I mean, okay, let me just step back. I'm going to just do this, if that's okay. I do this sometimes and embarrass authors by reading a little bit of their book. Is that okay with you? If I do read a little section? Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. I'm going to go from the beginning. All right, now uh, and. And, and gentle listeners know that I'll do the best I can. And so far, I've been pretty good on my pronunciation of Italian names, but um, hopefully he'll forbear any butchering. All right, so here we go. Um, chapter one, Rome, present day. My name is Vittoria Armieri. I work at the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, and I know everything. If you feel safe, well, you aren't. I know everything about you, too beginning with who you are and what your name is. I can tell where you are right now, what you do for a living, and whom you fantasized about just minutes ago. Like so many of the things that I know about you and anybody else, these are trivialities. These are facts that nobody cares about, least of all me. So I treat them like gnats that are buzzing around. I wait for them to fly off without even bothering to wave them away. But things are different when I come across a murderer like the guy on the bench opposite. I'm not talking about the older man with thick glasses. He is as clean as a whistle. In fact, he deserves compassion. At age 12, he was beaten unconscious by three seniors of his boarding school, and a year later, he was raped by a janitor. He has always kept it from everyone, denying it even to himself. But it happened. I know it did. Anyway, I was talking about the man sitting next to him, the guy in the blue coat who is now devouring his sandwich. His name is Domenico Morgelli, and he's 64. Back when he used to inflict on human beings the same savagery that he's now reserving for his food, he slaughtered a young man and a girl in their 20s. It's no coincidence that he was christened Dom the Butcher, 
by the whole of Rome at the time of his crime. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you read those paragraphs and not just dive in and read the whole thing as fast as you can? I, Aldo, seriously, uh, I, I don't like to, to, uh, to be too effusive, but sincerely, I'm hooked already on this book. Oh, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, especially because I, uh, it, it's so great uh, to listen to someone who's reading in English something that I wrote in English. Also, because let me say, it's, it's not my, I, I'm not a, a native English speaker. I mean, it is not necessary to say, but uh, maybe... Maybe it's interesting to know why I decided to write a book in English. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I mean, you tell me if it is something. Well, first of all, you, you anticipated my next question. Ah, okay. 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 So, so how about we go there, and then I want, I want to talk about why in English, and then what kind of book is this? You know, is it a thriller? Is it horror? Is it a mystery? We'll go into all of that. But please, take it away, Aldo. Let's, let's hear what your thoughts are on the origins of this book. Okay. I, I think the... the the way to um, define it better is, is to call it a psychological drama. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, but it is not completely, completely correct in the sense that uh, there is some drama, there is some tragedy, and, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, there is a, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the book has a, several um, facets, several uh, way, ways of approaching the story. So, uh, of course, it's a, it's a tragedy because this woman, um, she is, a, a, one could say that she's blessed with the power of uh, reading other people's lives, hmm. uh, accessing their thought, she can access their thought, their memories, their tragedies, but to her, this is no super, superpower. It's not a superpower at all. It's actually a curse. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, her life is so miserable uh, because of this, uh, that her only aspiration is to die. And she, and the most important thing that she wants, she wants to die at the ends of a murderer. And there is a reason for this. She doesn't want to die in an ordinary way. She doesn't want to, to take her own life. She wants to die. And, and the story develops, unfolds uh, uh, from this premise, which, is, which starts in the first pages exactly. In the, the following page after the, 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 the part that you have read. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, spo sp spoiling uh, the story. I'm just telling what's, what happens in the, first, in the first pages. But also, it's, it's also, um, despite being a tragedy, it's also a story of uh, love and friendship. I, I, I don't want to tell more about this because otherwise I risk to to really uh, tell too much right. and, and, and you know, it, it makes the book less interesting. I, I want people to, develop, to, to discover this by reading it. And, uh, and that's basically, uh, as I said, there are several faces because she is, she's unhappy, she's miserable, she wants to die. Uh, nevertheless, she's very sarcastic because this, this kind of a, uh, curse uh, puts her in a position to be, you know, disenchanted uh, towards life. Uh, people have no secrets in front of her. Uh, they bear in front of her. So, I mean, because of this, she, she can look at them uh, from a completely different perspective, not just at the people, but at life as well. So that that that's the scenario where the the book starts. Well, okay, and I think that's perfect. We don't have to go into plot points, of course. We and we don't like to do that anyway because it'll give it away. I want this to be a rich, uh, juicy read for everyone because, as I said, those first few paragraphs I read, 
I seriously, Aldo, I was, just, I was just like, oh my gosh, I love the premise. I love that you can read already that she's world weary and she has this superpower, but it's, it's actually a misery for her. I love all of this. So, well, let's talk about you and the writing of the book. Now, you said this was your first book in English. Let me just take a step back first, though. Your career has been based, in, as you said, in advertising. In fact, you've been a creative director. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, correct. So, yes, I've been a creative director. I started as a copywriter in, uh, in, an, in an agency in Florence uh, many, many years ago. Um, and then I moved to Milan, where, which is the, the capital of the advertising industry. It's not Rome, it's Milan. So I moved to Milan and, uh, and then I, I went through the usual process of, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, from uh, a, a small agency to a, a larger agency to a big agency. Um, and uh, in parallel, my career was developing. So from assist, assistant copywriter to junior copywriter, then to vice creative director, and then to creative director, and then to vice president of a, of a large, um, of some of the, the major uh, advertising agencies in Italy. Um, uh, I'm talking about, maybe you heard this name, uh, international agency like uh, Magnetics and YNR, y Young Arabicam. Oh called. yeah, yeah, YNR, yeah. sure. And um, and uh, and Low Low Group, which is uh, British actually uh, uh, agency. At the beginning, it was a British network. Uh, and then um, ten years ago, uh, I founded, uh, I co-founded together with my. Uh, our director partner, Roberto Pizzigoni and Barbara Rioli, I co-founded my own agency. So our own agency, which is Cernuto Pizzigoni and Partners, uh, which was a, a fantastic adventure. It still uh, is, uh, but the launch especially, it, it has been very exciting. What kind of clients do you generally serve? Well, you know, uh, having, th this is the, the, a question that when, when people ask me, what, what, what clients did you work with? Uh, I'd say all of them. <laughs> in, terms, in, terms, in terms of uh, industries, all of them. So there, I think there, there are no industries, uh, no kind of, uh, no clients that I didn't work for. Of course, the, the names uh, that, uh, I mean, are internationally known are uh, Volvo, uh, Alfa Romeo, Saab, um, uh, uh, Barilla, uh, and then many, many telecom uh, companies, it Italian and not Italian. Um, uh, I, I mean, uh, it's difficult for me to, to uh, because yeah, Subaru also, many oh, cars. Sure. Yeah. Ma many cars. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, other brands that maybe are uh, less popular in the United States, uh, like uh, in, in, the, in the design industry, uh, Artemide, which makes uh, uh, lamps, hmm. uh, designed lamps. So, I mean, uh, it, it's really difficult to find uh, some products or or um, or uh, services that I didn't work for. Yeah, I, it, very much a generalist approach. Uh, I'm my day job public relations, um, and I people ask me the same thing. Do you specialize? And typically, I did not for the first decades of my career, but now I do simply because I'm a small shop. But uh, so I I was just curious, and I I just have to say having formerly owned a Saab. I was so sad to see it go down. I was wow. so disappointed. Ugh. Wow. The same, same here. Yeah. Same here. Also because I, I worked for them uh, many years ago, several years ago. Of course, now they don't exist anymore, any longer. And, uh, and um, I, it was a fantastic car. One of the Best car I've ever driven. Okay. Which do you have? Did you have? Uh, can, can I? Ask you? I had a two, I had a two thousand one Saab nine three. Ah, yeah, great car. 
convertible. I, I had I had that too for a for a period because of course uh, yeah uh, as we had we were managing the client we were uh, given the car to uh, which was a a great uh, perk. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, no, I, I, it was beautiful, metallic, uh, that, meta- that wonderful metallic, uh, bluish metallic gray color, it's convertible, it, it just worked uh, like a dream, it had, all, they just thought about cars in a different way than most yeah. car makers, but it unfortunately wasn't sustainable, but forgive me for going off track there, but, so you, you let, started, let say, it, it's, it's not because of, of uh, the kind of uh, advertising that we did, that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, it I, wasn't I, your fault. I, I <laughs> it was because General Motors bought the brand and mishandled it probably more than anything. I'm afraid so. Yeah. Uh, my dad worked for General Motors for 25 years. I, I know a little bit about them. Um, but I will go back to the... To the so being, of course, uh, you started your creative life and your, your money-raking life writing with, with words. Um, had you written fiction prior to The Curse of Knowing? Well... Yes, I did, uh, because uh, I think you cannot, uh, you cannot even think of uh, publishing a, a novel without having uh, written something before. I, actually, previously, I, I wrote three novels, which are still in a drawer here. Uh, I sent one to a publisher 10 years ago, um, where I received a lot of compliments. Ah, beautiful story, fantastic uh, uh, idea. We love the way, in Italian, it was written in Italian. So it's brilliant, uh, very intelligent, but thanks, but no thanks, we are not interested. Uh, which is the, the classic uh, type of answer that all people from all over the world receive when they send a first piece of work to a publisher. But at that point I said, oh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, is is this um, interesting for me? Uh, I mean, I loved uh, writing it, I had fun. Uh, Let's put it in a drawer and let's leave it there for a while. You know, my my principle, my idea is that uh, you, you cannot write I don't know, you are a writer as well, so I, I, I want to share this with you. You cannot write a, a novel if you haven't uh, uh, written at least one million words and uh, thrown them away. Thrown them away because they're not worth, they're not good enough. Um, if you have done that, then you can start challenging you in something that uh, it's worth being read, it's worth being published, and especially it's worth being read. Yeah. A million words. I love that. I don't think I've ever heard that before. I, uh, you had not heard? Well, uh, no, it's not, it's not mine. I must, uh, I must confess this is not <laughs> mine. I've read, I've read this and I said, well, I totally agree. I mean, but you know, working in, in advertising means that you have to throw away a lot of ideas. Sometimes they are great, but, but and sometimes clients not always accept great ideas. Yeah. I would say the opposite, actually. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, um, and so, I mean, it, I was kind of used to, uh, to get rid of uh, ideas that I had uh, uh, come up with. Uh, so I said, this is not enough. The book is not enough. Then I started with this, uh, and I started in Italian. I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I started writing in Italian. Um, then I understood that the story maybe deserved something different, a different twist. Uh, I, I can tell you something about, about this uh, switch from Italian to English, because um, you, you know, if I'm boring, you interrupt me, eh? uh, Alex, please. You <laughs> say, I know, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> please don't, uh, go ahead. No, but you know, uh, uh, you, you, as a person that works in, with uh, ideas yourself, uh, you know that uh, 
working with ideas, you start learning how your mind works. Is that true? So, true. I mean, and, and after uh, doing this for a long while, I know how my, my mind works. I think I know how my mind works. I, I can make some mistakes also, but there are things that um, regard my, the way my brain works that I know. And, you know, uh, I, I know that my, work, my, my brain is sometimes a bit contrived. It is sometimes a bit contrived, which is not great for someone who works in advertising because you have to simplify everything. Everything is, is, is contrived at the beginning and you have to make it simple right. to deliver it to, to people. Uh, so I, I think I was not born for working in advertising. <laughs> uh, but it, nevertheless, I, I made it and um, I learned because you learn to be creative also. This, this is an important thing. People think that either you have talent or not. Right. It's right. not true. You learn. You, you talked sometimes about this, uh, mm -hmm. um, this uh, issue I uh, heard in, in other episodes. Um, I, and, uh, and so um, what, what is the difference between writing in English, writing in Italian and writing in English? Well, when I write in English, I'm somehow obliged to simplify. I, I'm obliged to simplify my language uh, because I I, um, I don't know my vocabulary is pretty good is rich enough but it's not as rich as it is in Italian of course because we, for obvious reasons. Okay, l let me uh, between brackets. I had uh, a, 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 an English speaking editor, English speaking native English speaking editor, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, polishing all my work and improving it and making it uh, work where it didn't because uh, otherwise it would have been impossible for me. But basically, my, uh, the flow of the story when, when I write in English becomes uh, easier, uh, which is good uh, uh, for different uh, aspects. First of all, the fact that uh, this is the, the way that uh, is mostly accepted. Uh, so short, short sentences, um, uh, straight to the point, uh, uh, not too many adverbs, not too many adjectives. So basically I discovered that uh, I am a better writer in English than uh, in, uh, in Italian. Oh. Um, or oh, 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 at least some people said that. I mean, I, I, I like to think they're right. <laughs> 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 no, that, that, that's the reason why. Um, uh, and and uh, in the end, uh, it, it has been a fantastic experience for me. Well, if what I just what I've sampled already is any indication and your editor has done a marvelous job working with you to polish these things, but the, the, the turns of phrase, the, the way it, it just flowed so, so, so damn well, I just really think it's excellent. I mean, I, I, I don't ever tell guests that, oh, I love your book if I don't. And so um, I, I always say nice things, but I like, oh, it's, I'm sure this is very interesting, but this is really those that, you know, it says so much that those first few paragraphs had just grabbed my attention so well. Um, uh, during this horrible lockdown we're in, I have a stack of books this high, not to mention my Kindle uh, to read. And I've had such fuzziness because I, everything's just a little up in the air and strange. And I've had a hard time focusing. But I remember as I sat down to look at the excerpts of your book, I thought, wow, this is one I want to keep getting into. I want to dig into. So, so cheers to you on that, sir. I think it's, it's magnificent the way you're doing that. Um, let me ask you a little bit about process, if I may. And I, I know these are tedious questions for writers, but a lot of writers who listen to the show want to hear about your process. First of all, if you don't mind telling us, uh, about how long did it take you to, to write The Curse of Knowing and how did you do it? Did you do it daily? Is there a certain place you wrote? Is there anything you want to tell us about how, how you do it? Sure. Um, it took uh, to me uh, some uh, five months um, to, to finish it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a very disciplined person. When I decide that uh, I have to wake up at four in the morning, I do that. Wow. And, uh, and uh, uh, 
also because I think the morning is, I mean, many writers, many people who work with ideas, uh, I'm sure will agree with me, uh, best ideas come in the morning. And uh, sometimes your brain has worked all, all night long, you, you didn't, didn't even realize that. But, uh, and then uh, when you wake up, uh, you have the, those ha-ha moments where you say, oh yes, th that, that's what I was looking for. Um, and uh, so I'm not the kind of uh, uh, whiskey and uh, nighttime uh, working with no smokes. No, 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 no. no. no I, I, I wake up early morning before even having breakfast, I start writing and uh, I, I, I write at least uh, two hours, three hours in the morning and two hours uh, in the afternoon, in the early afternoon. And then uh, the last uh, uh, hour before, uh, before going to sleep, uh, I review, I edit all what uh, I have written during the day. I know this is not something you should do. Everybody says, no, that's wrong. You edit at the end. You don't edit day by day. I don't know, what, what you, you, Alex, what, what do you do? Well, I was going to say, actually, I, I was taught that you should not. My, my grandfather was a writer for 50 years, and he, he, did, he said, I don't do anything. I write the draft, then I go back. But I found, but he didn't have, he didn't have computers. He didn't have word processing. I, I have found that I'll write my bit for the day, usually a minimum of a thousand words. And then the next day, when I go back to write, I reread what I did, and I start, I start doing what I call micro editing of that. Um, I try not to go overboard because if I spend an hour micro editing that piece, I won't get to my next thousand words. So that's, that's how I do it. Well, this is also, I think it's, it's a great method. The only reason why I edit in the, in the, uh, before the night, before going to sleep is that uh, otherwise, you know what happens that I wake up, I read what I had written the day before, and I get depressed oh. <laughs> because I said, oh, no, well, no, it doesn't work. Instead, if I, if I make it work at night, then I, I, in the morning, I, I, I go through what I quickly just to put my brain in, in, uh, in the way, the right way. And I say, well, okay, it works. I can go uh, ahead with this. So it's just, you know, I like, you know, our brains, um, they trick us sometimes, but you can also learn how to trick your brain. Um, and I, 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 I have a passion for this, uh, for this uh, thing. Uh, in the sense, I, I, I like reading book about, uh, uh, about how the mind and the brain works, work uh, together, combined, uh, how ideas. I, I actually wrote a, an, a, bo a book years ago about, um, uh, how ideas are born in advertising. I wrote mm -hmm. a, a book which was uh, Il Mal di Dea, The Idea Ache, several, several years ago. Uh, because it's, it's a passion. I, I, I like, I, I love to understand uh, the process of, uh, of the, um, the human brain, the, the, according the way the, the human brain works and elaborate and work, works out ideas. So that leads me to another question then. Um, did, do you have, do you outline or do you, do you just establish the character and then let, let the story go every day? Or do you have an, do you have a, I guess I should say, do you have an end in sight when you first sit down to write the book? Um, I don't know. I think probably I had, but I don't know. In, in the sense, uh, let, let, I, 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 this is an interesting question. I, you know, there are, as you certainly know, maybe you are one of them, there are writers who are kind of engineers of, of the stories. They, they know exactly what is going to happen, every, every character, and, but in my view, and I, I mean, uh, of course, this is the first uh, um, novel that I published, but the, the, I learned this from my previous experiences. I believe that characters have their own lives. They, they don't want you to uh, um, predestine 
uh, no, I, I I don't know how to say this uh, in English because it's not, it's not you you don't want uh, to uh, decide in advance what they're going to do next. Yeah, they, they have to decide. So of course, so everything is in my into my within my brain, and and but but I don't push them to do things that do, they don't want to do. So this is way the way I usually I have the story in mind. But I'm ready to, to, to bend it a little bit, to change direction, to, to, to drive to an, another, uh, towards a place that I didn't think of before. Or, so, I mean, I mean I, I'm not the kind of person uh, who knows the ending uh, precisely in the moment uh, in which they write the first paragraph. It's not, it's not my attitude. It's not my. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm the same. I, I don't want to straightjacket my characters because I don't want to be writing something with a predestination in mind. And then what if I'm writing something? And then, as you said, the character has a life of its own and it kind of just organically, as I'm writing, wants to do something else. I can't be the one saying, no, no, stop, because at the end, I want you to be here. I just let it go. I, as I've said this before many times, forgive me if you've, you heard the shows when I've mentioned this. Uh, I think I said this to Adriana as well, uh, one of our recent guests, and Bert, another recent guest, um, writers. I, I like to have characters that are full and rich, and my books are thrillers, and I like to put them in thrilling or mysterious situations and let them figure it out. That's how I like to do it. Yeah. It sounds like that's what you're up to. I completely agree with you. I am totally with you in, in, in this sense. Also because, you know, I'm sure people sometimes ask you, as they ask me, where did your inspiration come from? This kind of question about inspiration. But, you know, inspiration is not, it's not mathematics. It's not a, um, a list of things that you have to do that you want and that you have to make uh, uh, to adapt to the situation. Inspiration is, means to me, it means leaving your mind free of thinking. And, and, and that is the moment where inspiration hits you, uh, strikes you. <laughs> right. uh, this is the way I see it. Yeah. Do you, um, I, I, I've discussed this with a lot of authors. Do you find yourself when you're doing, uh, taking a walk, a stroll to the store, uh, the market, do you ever, does something hit you out of the blue or does it all work on you when you're at the keyboard or at the page? No, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, uh, I know this uh, from, from experience. Uh, your mind never stops working. You, when, the moment you give uh, an input to your mind, Whatever you're doing, uh, even though you, you think that you're not thinking of that problem, your mind is at work. And it's a, it is working to find uh, a solution. And usually, uh, I know this uh, working in, in advertising, you know, you, 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 you need ideas. Ideas come when you least expect them. Uh, they can come while you are at the grocery stop or, or you're going to the bathroom or, or you, uh, to the... To the laboratory or uh, so i mean uh, yeah I, I i i think it is uh, that that kind of uh, uh, situation what uh, if anything and i know this is your first novel but that doesn't mean it it's obviously not your first words as we discussed you've been writing your entire life if to the writers out there who have not started or have not finished their first novel um, I, like you, have three or four in a drawer that, that didn't go anywhere, and that's where they'll stay. So that's, that's a lot of the work you put into it. But, but what about the writer out there listening right now who thinks, I think I've got something here. I just don't know how to make it happen. You've already mentioned you're extremely disciplined, which is very obvious from how you describe, described your routine. But is there any advice you would offer the new writer or the want-to-be writer? Um, yes. Uh, I, I have a piece of... Uh... There is something I believe uh, uh, it, it is very important for whoever uh, starts writing a book. Never, ever tell your idea of a book to anyone. Keep it for yourself. Because if you talk to someone else and you say, uh, oh, I'm writing a book, uh, well, what is it uh, about? Well, 
it is about, and you start telling the story, your brain thinks, great, mission accomplished. You have done it. You don't have to think of that anymore. And, you, and it is the death of the idea. It's the death of, of the novel. So you have to suffer, uh, to brace yourself in a way, and, and suffer uh, to, to, to give birth to the idea. Only when it's done, you can talk. Stephen King, in his book about writing, said, you write with the door closed. In other words, you don't open the door when you're writing until you have a draft to show to a beta reader or an editor. But you, this is what you're saying, isn't it? You write with the door closed. You don't talk about it. You don't say, how are these pages I wrote today? You wait until it's the proper time. I love that the way you framed that, though, Aldo. That is so good and useful because... I don't talk about my work because I feel like I'm boring people anyway. <laughs> you know, my, my wife, you know, she, she reads it, but you know, uh, you know, so I, when people ask me what I'm working on, I just say my character, John Pilot, I say, John's in another mess. And when you, when it's done, you can read all about it and I leave it alone. But I like what you just said there because it's almost as if you talk about it, you're draining a battery or you're, or even just in the talking about it, you could be malignantly changing how the story is going to go based on the reaction of the person you're telling it to. Is that something? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, and wow. it, it, it can be very uh, counterproductive. It can be dangerous. Uh, so, I mean, it's not, uh, of course, Stephen King, I mean, uh, who can, uh, uh, he's right. Uh, the door closed. I, I said, yeah, door closed, mouth shut. Uh, every 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 uh, hole or sphincter of your body, <laughs> no. your pores. Uh, you you must not nobody because it 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 must be a mystery to the other. Yeah, and then you unveil the mystery, and that that, that is the most beautiful moment. I know we're running low on time here, so I want to just ask you a couple of quick uh, wrap-up questions, and then we'll make sure we mention where people can buy the book. But now that you have this done, and I know it's early days, you've just released the book, correct, in July, right? Um, just a yesterday. 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 Yeah, as we record this on July 15th, yes, it was launched. Yet. But this is the question all writers get that we kind of dread, especially the day after we've released our book. But what's next? Exactly. I, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. You, you did not fall into my trap at all. <laughs> exactly. It was a trick, was it? It was. It was. It was. It was. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sure won't, I have ideas and I want to uh, start writing uh, immediately. Um, tomorrow. Uh, I won't do that tomorrow, but uh, uh, um, I, I never stop writing, basically. But... I haven't started a new novel yet, but I have ideas and they are, they are somehow uh, moving inside my head, not, not in a clear way yet, but I, I, there are, I mean, I, once you start writing, you can't, you, you can stop. I can stop. Right. Well, and, and I would be disappointed if you'd had any other answer to that question. That was perfect. That was perfect. I expected that. I, I can't, I almost, I thought, oh, I'm going to get him on that one. But nope, you did. Um, the, 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 the Curse of Knowing, this is by Aldo Cernuto. It is, let's see, it's published by, who is your publisher? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm missing that, that work there. The Clink Street Publish. Ah, Clink Street. The Clink Street Publishing. And it's available Amazon.com, Europe, yeah. everywhere, yeah. or uh, all Amazons, all Amazons uh, across the world, um, and some other uh, online uh, uh, bookstores, several other uh, online so, bookstores. Yeah. Paperback and ebook. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And do you have a website or anything we should point to at this point? Oh no! Everybody, my publisher included, and my editor told me you should have a. Um, a, a website. Uh, no, I have a, a, a Facebook uh, author page, which, oh, okay. uh, which I didn't want to, to open as well, but uh, <laughs> they told me you had to. And I have a central author Amazon page. Right. 